Good evening, and thank you all for coming. I'm here to welcome you to the first event of the Spring 2012 Holloway Series in Poetry. My name is Cecil Giscombe. Rosa Martinez and I have been working to put together, I, th I think, a rather stellar lineup for this uh, semester, and I hope that you'll join us for the other, other events. Let me tell you who's coming. Uh, the next reader, uh, the next reading is going to be taking place on February 2nd, which is a week from, a week from today. And our featured poet is Claudia Rankine. She's the author of Don't Let Me Be Lonely and The End of the Alphabet, among other books. And she's uh, editor of, uh, of American women, women Poets of the 21st Century, where lyric meets language. She's coming as a guest of both the Holloway series and the Mixed Blood series, which means that she'll be giving a reading at 6.30 in this room and a talk on the intersections uh, between innovative poetry and race at 4 p.m. in Wheeler 300. Please try to, try to come to it, uh, both of those if you can and, and, uh, and bring your friends. And then on um, February 23rd, we will have another Holloway mixed blood reading and talk. Our poet for that event is M. Norbase Philip, who will be coming from Toronto. On March 8th, the invited poet is Martin Corliss Smith, who will be coming down from Boise. And on April the 10th, we'll welcome from Philadelphia, Ron Silliman. Tonight's event is a special reading. With us is uh, this year's um, UC Regents lecturer, Lorna de Cervantes. Well, she's not with us yet. She, we've um, gotten a phone call. She uh, got stuck in traffic on the Bay Bridge, and she was on Ashby a few minutes ago. And so she's making her way, her way towards us. Um, but it's OK. The, uh, uh, she's, the, she's the reader, and she'll be introduced by, um, <clears throat> and she'll be introduced by, uh, excuse me, Ari uh, Dimitrio. The Holloway series is possible because of a bequest from Roberta C. Holloway, a poet who graduated BA in honors uh, in English from, uh, from Berkeley in 1923. She earned a PhD from this department in 1945. She subsequently enjoyed a teaching career at San Jose State, but she remembered the special community of the Berkeley English Department and was generous with us in her will. Because of her generosity, this reading series continues. Traditionally, the Holloway uh, evenings include a reading by a UC Berkeley graduate student poet. I now invite Jennifer Reimer. Are you here? Ah, to uh, a graduate student from Ethnic Studies to introduce our, our graduate poet this evening, who is Javier O. Huerta. Um, and I think Javier's going to read maybe a little bit longer than, than he would otherwise. Uh, so, Ms. Reimer, if you would come up and take care of this. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Holloway series. Um, it's an honor and it's a privilege to introduce Javier O. Huerta at this evening's Holloway reading. I've been an enormous fan of Huerta's work since we met in 2006 in a graduate poetry writing workshop here in the English department at UC Berkeley. From the gentrified ex barrios of the Bronx to shady vodka bars in the heart of Manhattan and aging jazz clubs in Chicago, I've had the dubious pleasure of following many of Huerta's misadventures in poetry, performance, and partying in the years since. I feel lucky to have witnessed as fellow poet, publisher, scholar, and friend, pieces of the arc of production that has resulted in the manuscript from which Huerta, Huerta will read tonight. You guys are in for a treat. Javier O. Huerta is the author of Some Clarifications y Otros Poemas, published by Arte Publico in 2007, which won the Ch Chicano Latino Literary Prize from UC Irvine. His poems have recently been anthologized in American Tensions, Literature of Identity and the Search for Social Justice, and The Best American Non-Required Reading, 2011. His second book, American Copia, an Immigrant Epic, is forthcoming from Arte Publico Press in March of this year. 
Originally from Nuevo Laredo via Houston, Texas, he currently lives, studies, and writes in Berkeley. Before it was a complete manuscript, selections from Huerta's epic, American Copia, appeared in the winter 2008 edition of my press's Achote Seeds Journal. In the preface to this poem, Huerta informs us that his poem draws inspiration from Erasmus's 1512 book, Copia, An Abundance of Style. In this book, Erasmus argues for the necessity of many and varying stylistic techniques in rhetoric. In one chapter, he famously demonstrates 195 ways to write the sentence, your letter pleased me greatly. In revising this classic study, Huerta chooses to use the sentence he was required to write in order to pass his naturalization exam during his INS interview. This sentence is, today I am going to the grocery store. <laughs> In the years since, Huerta has reflected on the complicated relationships between citizenship, patriotism, love, and language. In particular, he confesses that he's been struck by the abundance of language. He claims that his American copia is not an epic, but quote, an attempt to explore the abundance of experience encapsulated within that one sentence. This marks a provocative shift away from Erasmus, from an abundance of style for the persuasive purpose of rhetorical elegance and diversity, to the abundance of experience as witnessed through multiple languages and syntactical play. Huerta experiments, riffs on, revises, and sometimes faithfully reproduces his original sentence. What remains constant throughout is a careful troubling of relationships and categories of identity. American copias shifting and multiple lenses reveal glimpses of multiple identities, undocumented, naturalized, student, son, brother, nephew, lover, consumer, poet. Supermarkets mark the uneasy boundaries of nation and identity. From the bougie Safeway on Oakland's Grand Avenue to the Fiesta Supermercado in the Houston neighborhood where he grew up, Huerta's poem troubles and teases very playfully the cultural and national boundaries drawn between piñatas and alote, popsicles and bonbons. The circular migratory motion to and from bodega and supermarket, Mexico, the Bay Area, and Texas Barrio are captured in Huerta's winding syntax and the shifting temporal frame of the poem. Huerta jumps from childhood to adolescence to adulthood in no chronological order. As a political statement, the poem's circular time refuses to privilege the moment of naturalization by re reinforcing a before-after temporality. Poetically, Huerta's lines mimic the compression and multiplicity of memory where his multiple experiences can appear as if they occur simultaneously. His long lines blur the border between the Whitman-esque poetic line and a prose poem. They continually point outward into a multiplicity of cultural references. The densely allusive and intertextual quality of the lines adds depth and texture. Huerta's copia succeeds in recreating both as spectacle and as poetic material the idea of a truly American abundance. Yet, like so much of the American writing that counts today, Huerta redefines the very term American itself, loosening it from a national ima imaginary bound to geopolitical and ideological borders to encompass a more transnational and hemispheric understanding of America. In doing so, American Copia imagines new forms of imagination itself that can and will shape the future of literary production in the American hemisphere. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Javier Huerta. Hello. Uh, Good evening. Um, Cecil Giscombe said I have to read a bit, a little longer than I than I thought, but I brought my whole manuscript, so <laughs> I could just read it until uh, to learn. I guess here. Uh, thanks to Rosa and Cecil and um, Marcial for inviting me to read. 
um, in uh, the Holloway. This is my third time as the um, as the uh, the graduate student poet. So maybe it's time to move on and, and do something else. But thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, um, I'm nervous. So I'm going to tell you a joke. Uh, those weren't jokes. The ones you laughed at. Those. Um, um, what does a corn tortilla say to a wheat tortilla? You know, they have wheat tortillas now, right? Uh, made out of wheat. Um, what does a corn tortilla say to a wheat tortilla? No te aguites. So I don't want to jump. I wanna, that's in here. I right? get uh, American copia. Um, thanks to Jen, uh, Jennifer Reimer, for, uh, for introducing me. Um, and introducing the American Copia, which I think I'm going to read mostly from American Copia. And as she said, um, American Copia first um, came about when, <coughs> I'm recognizing faces as I'm reading. Uh, American Copia came about when uh, she and um, Craig Santos Perez in invited me to, um, to contribute uh, like 10 pages to uh, Chelsea Seats. And, um, and I don't know if you read my other stuff, I'm kind of square, right, when it comes to like poetics and I, you know, I just do what, you know, I write personal stuff and uh, immigration, love stuff. And, but I know that their, um, their ethos or, you know, the, the mag there was this like experimental avant-garde sort of edge to the show TCs, which is still around. Um, so then for me, it's like, well, what, what is experimental? Then I thought going to the grocery store is like about as experimental as I, I can get. Um, um, as I was reading this week, uh, I've been going through the galleys um, of the copia because it's coming out in, in March, and um, I realized that it's all the great things that Jen said. Uh, you know, I think that's all in there. Thank you, Jen. Uh, but I also realized that it's a big like kiss and tell book. Like uh, go to grocery stores with people, you know, um, kiss, and then I just tell, you know, talk about it in the. Um, and the copia, and um, like one example, I'm, I'm looking at it right here, is just um, I kissed Maribel Falcón in El Fiesta ATX y le gustó, which is very straightforward kiss and tell, right? I mean, it's not, there's no metaphor in there or anything. It's just, um, but of course, people don't like when you put their name in the, in the books, you know, about kissing and tell. So I changed it to J O H kiss M F and L H E B ATX y le gustó. Um, <laughs> I have other um, other kiss and tell stories in here, which I'm going to go through. Um, but I wanted to read um, the opening of Copia, just so you get a, um, a sense of it. I'll just read um, American Copia from the beginning. Uh, today I'm going to the grocery store. December 14, 2007, Javier Omar Huerta Gomez is going with Maria in, in the yellow 74 VW Bug to the Safeway on Grand Avenue in Oakland, California. When I was young, my mother bought our groceries from Fiesta. She also bought our shoes and clothes there. Thinking back on it, I've always wanted to write a stand-up comedy routine to be performed in the voice of a Mexican Jeff Foxworthy. If your mother ever bought you tennis shoes from the same house she got the tortillas, you might be a mojado. <laughs> Today, I'm going to the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks. Last January, Maria and I walked approximately a mile around Lake Merritt to get to the Albertsons on 18th, and after buying our groceries, call for a taxi which takes up to an hour. We learn not to buy ice cream or popsicles. Tonight, I will open my refrigerator and utter those wonderful words by John Keats, oh, generous food. You may not know this line because critics have reduced, have reduced Keats to the great olds. Recommendation, read his Robin Hood poems. Whenever I go back to Houston, I make sure to go to Fiesta on the corner of Bel Air and Hillcroft to get some elote from the elote men in the parking lot. Then I enter the store, not to buy anything, but to count the piñatas hanging from the ceiling. America, when would you be worthy of your 12 million and one Sancho Panzas? 
Well, morning before dawn, Huerta will walk with his wife to the 24-hour convenience store to buy some low-fat milk, and his biographers will mistakenly, mistakenly call this romance. After a month of depending on taxis, Maria and I realized that there are, there are unofficial taxis that drive people around the lake for $5. A woman named Laura loads our groceries into her station wagon. By the time she drops us off on the other side of the lake, we learn of her past on the East Coast and of her future in Texas. She does not tell us what she happens to be doing in Oakland. On Sundays, my mother always bought the Houston Chronicle for the coupons it carried. She put on her glasses and spent about two hours clipping. She needed my help reading the small print because she couldn't make it out no matter how much she squinted or how many times she adjusted her glasses. And she also needed my help translating the English words. She had a special pouch for them. Sundays always smelled like coupons. One November night in El Paso, I went to the supermarket and ran into Benjamin Alida's signs. You may not know who he is because Chicano poets remain, for the most part, unanthologized. He is my mentor and doesn't know that we call him El Cura. Recommendation, read his essay, I want to write an American poem. The best time to the, go to the grocery store is late on a Saturday night because everyone must be doing something else. The only problem is that the shelves have not been restocked. We used to go dancing on Saturday, says Maria. I grab her, and we move to a cumbia beat down the canned food aisle. An Ethiopian woman delivers injera every afternoon to the corner store. She brings them in a minivan and unloads them herself. They sell, well, like hotcakes. Once, in Stafford, Texas, Paul and his brother Roy stole their mother's food stamps. We went to 7-Eleven and used up a month's worth of food stamps on junk food. The clerk should have known better. After a while, I left. They stayed behind playing video games. After I had been home for about half an hour, Roy and Paul's mother stormed into our apartment and startled my mother and me. She threatened to call the police. How in the world would she feed her daughters? The food stamps were all she had. I snitched and told her where Paul and Roy were. She called the police and had her sons arrested. My mother did not talk to me for a week. That was the first time I understood that even white people can be poor. Today I would notice that the supermarket has 14 aisles and remember that a young poet I know told me she had written a Safeway sonnet. Not being able to recall the verses, I regret not having paid attention. I, want, I will wonder whether I will encounter her red hair as I turn into the 14th aisle. In the summer of 2006, Maria buys a red cart in Oakland's Chinatown. We are now able to walk around the lake to buy our groceries and carry them in our red cart. We realize that if we walk fast enough, we are able to enjoy ice cream and popsicles again. May 14, 2006, while I wait my turn at the checkout stand, hours since TV informs me that the poet Stanley Kunitz has died at the age of 100. One Wednesday evening in the fall of seventh semester, Matt, Ben, and I go to Andronicals on, in North Berkeley to purchase some wine and beer for the meeting of the Victorian Reading Group at Ruth. I suggest we should take dessert, but Ben says someone else is already taking care of it. He is right. We have bonbons. They are good, good. <laughs> Recommendation, Rena Scan, Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market. Days of 1984, my mother would buy frozen everything, fish, fries, chicken patties, and pizza. She bought these items because they were easy to make. At the time, she worked in the kitchen at Luby's during the day, and in the evening worked in housekeeping housekeeping at the Western Galleria. I made dinners for my brother and me. It was easy. Place the fish sticks on a baking sheet and take them out when they were golden. My mother did not know that these items were high in trans fat and sodium. America, when will you learn that you, you will find no sweeter fat than sticks to your own bones? I learned early enough that there were two classes of people in Houston, those that shop at Randall's and those that shop at Fiesta. In fall of 2006, Maria and I learn about the Safeway on Grand, which means we do not have to walk around the lake anymore. Good. The joggers were beginning to be annoyed with us. If you want to, we can even take the AC Transit number 12 to the store. It is a new store, but the same system. Maria makes a grocery list, and I, paper and pencil in hand, make sure we stay under budget. Today, we're going to walk down to the bodega on the corner and buy some chips. Maria is learning Arabic from the clerk, Ahmad. So far, she knows how to say hello, how are you, thank you, and farewell. I want her to ask him how to say, today I'm going to the grocery store. One day, 
I will step into a real life Piggly Wiggly and only then will I be able to write a truly American poem. <laughs> Saturday morning, Maria and I are going to the Grand Lake Farmer's Market. We will laugh when we see the in peach stand next to the peach stand because it is clever. We will buy a bag of salad and be fascinated with the edible flowers. How is it that flowers can be so delicious to us? We decide that they are so because we are descended from dinosaurs. Once upon a time, George Bush, George Bush I did not know the price of a gallon of milk. In Considerations for American Freiristas, Victor, Victor Villanueva Jr. discusses how one of his students works as a grocery checker. While his student drives the BMW, the GSI Villanueva must steal a car to get his groceries home. Huerta reads and presents on this article for his teaching methods class. He discovers pedagogy of the oppressed and becomes impassioned with Paulo Freire. His, his composition director notices the enthusiasm and advises him that one can practice liberatory pedagogy as long as one does not announce it too loudly. <laughs> Wanting to emulate Villanueva, Huerta attempts to steal a grocery cart, but nowadays they have those smart carts. Those things lock up on you. <laughs> Huerta thus managed to grow out his hair and his beard. His biographers will mistakenly call this commitment. Today, I'm going to the grocery store to buy a six pack of V8. It is the first step in reconciling with my father. The one thing I remember the most about the day I first arrived in Houston from Mexico is that my aunts were at the grocery store. I asked, I asked my grandmother where my tia Pera was. She said she had gone to fiesta. I misunderstood and thought she had gone to a party. I remember also one time when my youngest brother Saul and his friends were watching music videos and Fiesta by R. Kelly came on. In the video, R. Kelly is at a party and he and all his entourage chant Fiesta, Fiesta. <laughs> then one of my brother's friends says, hey fool, sería más tight if they sing La Muchacana, La Muchacana. <laughs> and we laughed. We started dancing and chanting La Muchacana. We could not stop laughing. It was a joke not meant for you. The day of my book release, the first one, uh, Alejandra and I went to Long's to buy beer and wine for the party. We also needed forks but could only find sporks. In the end, we went with assorted cutlery. We made sure to get receipts so we could be reimbursed. It was a lovely party. Alejandro read, someone introduced me, and all my friends bought my book. Well, at the store, however, I was unsure whether you would show up. One day in the future, Reiko envisions, we will have to explain to our younger generations how we used to go to these places called supermarkets and exchange a piece of paper for our sustenance. That the world begins and ends at the grocery store is an absurdity that we can no longer afford. Tonight, Maria and I are going to shop for groceries online. While waiting for his family at the fiesta on Maine, Huerta enjoys a rosé de lote when he notices the headlines of one of the local Houston area Spanish newspapers. Literato mexicano Octavio Paz ha fallecido. The headline grabs Huerta's attention not because it announces the death of the Mexican Nobel laureate. To tell the truth, he had never heard of Paz, but because the combination of literato and mexicano sounds so strange to him. A Mexican man of letters. Huerta's biographers will mistakenly describe this moment as epiphany. In the next two moments, he reads every book by Paz that can be found in the stacks at the University of Houston's Anderson Library. Huerta will incorrectly, will incorrectly conclude that Paz's prose is more poetic than his verse. At this time, he's not yet mature enough to, be, to comprehend Paz's poetry. One of his biographers will correctly claim that Huerta was never able to mature to the level of Paz. My first week in El Paso, Nancy gave me a ride to the MFA party at Lexus House. We stopped at Albertsons. I had never been to a writer's party before and didn't know what writers like. Nancy also had no idea. We decided on steak and a bottle of Merlot. During my second year in El Paso, feeling nostalgic for my earlier years, I buy all my shirts at the supermarket, which means I have to wear many Hawaiian style shirts <laughs> and a whole lot of polyester. Once in Stafford, Texas, 
I wish that grocery stores and supermarkets would carry my book. They could shove it next to the cereal because I want people to read my poems during breakfast. I could even give readings over in the produce section. I promise not to mention mangoes, pomegranates, or artichokes. <laughs> Neighbors share their concerns that the new Whole Foods on Harrison and the new Trader Joe's on Lakeshore will cause rent increases. When Maria and I visit my mother, she takes us to H-E-B to buy whatever we may need or want during our stay. We get Diet Cokes, water, ice cream, and popsicles. We offer to pay, my mother would not have it. She pulls out money and coupons from her purse. Coupons have always smelled like Sundays. December 14, 2007, Maria and I are going to the grocery store in our yellow VW bug. When we load and unload our groceries, people stare at us because Labette, the beast, that is what we have named our car, has his truck in the front. People think our car has broken down. Some even offer assistance. So that was the, um, that was the first section of um, American Copia, which I didn't think I was going to read all of it, but I did. Um, so I think I'm just going to read um, just a couple of more things. Uh, I'm searching a couple of more things, and uh, we can move on. Um, I, have to, I have some Spanish poems in the Copia. Um, I'll read the, the first two in the book. Me das algo, te doy dinero, los dos vamos en el camino. Es un sistema económico completamente básico. El comprador vendedor existe por el tiempo que se necesita. No hay pasado ni futuro. Esto suena como un punto de vista del mundo muy frío, pero hay momentos en los que es apropiado. Cuando voy a la tienda no quiero conversar con la cajera o que me pregunte acerca de mi vida. Ayer por la tarde, en el quinto día del pánico, empecé. Un poco deprimido, no podía salir a la calle. Yo no tenía ganas de leer más noticias. Intenté trabajar un ensayo contra mi amiga Alegría y el navegar por las nubes. Me senté en casa por mi cuenta hasta casi la medianoche. Mientras tanto, mi mamá me llamó para decirme, es cada vez más difícil estar fuera de cobertura. Mi respuesta, voy a la tienda a comprar leche y cereal. Hoy es un día nuevo y estoy decidido a hacer lo bueno. Estoy preocupado por alegría, mi amiga, una vez más. Um, I'll read one more, one more poem. Um, and, um, you know, the, uh, the, this, the last things that I'm going to read aren't from Copia. They're from um, a new book. Um, I submitted a, a manuscript to, um, to a contest in, in January. Um, what I did is I took all my, um, I hope I find it. I took all my... Um, failed projects, and I put them together and made one project, and, <laughs> and I called it Varia, you know, to give it like a sophisticated name, like various. Um, hopefully I find it. I'm gonna, uh, let's give me some time. Um, yeah, and the, um, you know, Copia is about a place where, and I don't particularly would go on my own to a grocery store. I only go to grocery stores with other people. That's why this project turned out to be Great is almost like a book of friends, right? Uh, people I go to the grocery store with, uh, or sometimes dragged. My roommate likes to drag me to Costco like every other week. Uh, so we go halves on everything. Um, um, but then the, this, this, this other poem that I'm going to read is about another place that maybe I should spend more time at. Um, it's called The Man in the Lonely Library. Um, that was kind of a joke. But, uh, the Man in the Lonely Library. One, we are meant as an antidote to the boredom of borders. We know each other only as citizens. Our bodies disappear. No, no distinction between hunger and gluttony. The gesture is the same, a gaping mouth. The inside of a mouth is my favorite part of the body. These mouths speak, these mouths do not speak. They bite, eat, devour, kiss, and groan but they do not say you. Our strangers crave dialogue. All that our strangers desire is to engage in conversation. A mouth that devours is a mouth that does not answer. Uh, two. 
Somehow to live in your world is to live in a circus. All the world's a freak show. You and I, merely freaks. My mask comes off only once you close your eyes. This is the logic of the confessional. This is the logic of the lyric. Oh reader, look away. This is the logic of Lucha Libre. I believe all of Mexico would have closed his eyes. What really happens is that an identity vanishes. We triumph, of course, by making our analysis seem absurd. Most amazingly, you not only believe in this universe yourself, but ask me to believe in it as well. Three. All italicized words appear as typographical phantasms. Even words have a past that cannot be left behind. I want to speak of violence in your longing. Here, everything is supposed to be settled, yet our revision continues. To live in the borderlands means to be half fresh, half, half flesh, half machine. That should have been the epigraph to our beyond, not as flesh, but as ashes. The identity, the identity experiments continue. Our fragmentation, you, I tell myself, is what it must mean to have hunger as home. We should end this conversation with a promise. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Lorna de Cervantes is one of the most distinguished Chicana poet poets of our time. Her work has been taught at major universities and featured across hundreds of anthologies, magazines, and journal publications, most notably the Norton Anthology of American Literature. Born in San Francisco of Mexican and Native American ancestry, Cervantes became deeply invested in the socio-political critiques that emerged from the Chicano movement of the 1960s and 1970s, particularly issues surrounding the political activism of women. During her college years, she founded Mango Publications, a small press geared toward the publication of Chicano and Chicana writers. Her first collection of poetry, Emplumada, won the prestigious American Book Award only one year after its publication in 1981. Thereafter, she founded and edited Red Dirt, a magazine of multicultural literature, and she began teaching creative writing at the University of Colorado um, at Boulder in 1989. In 1991, she published her second book titled From the Cables of Genocide, Poems of Love and Hunger. Years later, Cervantes published a monumental publication titled Drive, the First Quartet, a large selection of poems spanning five books and two decades. Her work has been translated into several languages, and she has been the recipient of many honors and awards, including the Leela Wallace Reader's Digest Award, the Patterson Prize for Poetry, the Latino Book Award, and the Batrick Award for Poetry, among others. In Ciento, her newest publication, Cervantes' Cervantes's exploration of love meets her ongoing themes of social justice, cultural identity, linguistic code switching, and the intellectual concerns of women. The book's title, Siento, emphasizes feeling and aesthetic expression. However, we may benefit from considering the dual significance of the unavoidable word that hovers above the two lovers depicted on the cover. The poet writer Luis Alberto Urrea mentioned elsewhere that the book's title, said out loud, not only means 100, but can be read in another way to say, I feel. Urrea is calling attention to Cervantes' clever pun, which invites us to view the book's title not simply for its given meaning, which is the number 100, but rather for the author's capacity to feel, the capacity which is here flourishing within a word limit that denotes the formal constraints of aesthetic representation, but also the constraints of a life lived, the length of a century, a lifespan, a generation. Indeed, when, we, when, when spelled with an S, the word siento means to feel, and on this aspect alone, the title deserves further consideration. However, Urrea's primary definition of ciento, meaning 100, deserves to be expanded and given greater capaciousness. It is actually the word cien, not ciento, which in Spanish is used to denote only the number 100. 
The word ciento, with an O, still signifies 100, but it differs from cien in that it anticipates a succeeding number. That is, it is used only when it precedes another number greater than 100, as in 101 or ciento y uno. The word ciento, therefore, more precisely signifies 100 and something more. This small detail should not escape us, as it is this invisible yet implied succession that serves to realize any possibility of love that may be found outside the formal constraints and yet born from within them. Implied succession in this case becomes progression and form becomes content. In doing so, Cervantes's 100, 100 word love poems traverse the ostensible delimitations of word count to express what is right before our very eyes. That our lives, like words, are more than three dimensional, are more three dimensional and cubistic than they readily appear to be. That words, like our lives, take on pluralities of significance that endlessly surprise us. The first poem in Ciento, titled Possibilities in 100 Words, is the first and most privileged of many poems in the collection, precisely because it introduces us to the very question that will answer itself time and time again throughout this explosive book of love. What are the possibilities of love, and how are they expressed? The first poem commences this explicit theme inside of a heavy, pressurized, almost negating atmosphere. In the final lines, it states, quote, after I said I love you, you could have hammered me over the heart with the silence. With the uttered words, I love you, the poem implodes like a star and gives birth to an expansive universe, effectively multiplying, quote, the conditions of possibil possibility through which every other poem will express itself thereafter. Her prose poetry in this first poem captures a broken conduit of communication and registers the painful silence of a passionate love that meets only a void a love which is given voice and directed towards someone, yet a love left suspended in the space of anticipation, wavering and deflating by the absence of reciprocation, until finally it turns back upon the speaker with the swift violence of a nail being hammered through one's heart. This love, however, is far from being effectively suppressed. The last image of resolute silence serves not to delimit the capacity of love, but rather to mediate its power back in and through the poet the voice that is affirmatively emplumada, equipada con un bolígrafo y lista para volar, that is, the voice that is feathered, equipped with a pen and ready to fly, as Cervantes's first book suggests. Despite the pain conveyed by this poem's ending, Cervantes's initial effort to, quote, multiply the conditions of possibility, remains as fecund as the, quote, leftover gardens and hard red pots, which he describes earlier in the poem. These images suggest that the potentialities of love remain latent but very much alive as if buried in fertile soil and ready to sprout with equal or greater force to that of the hammer which here only ostensibly buries them. In every page that follows, the possibilities of love will take root and emerge through a wide plurality of expressions. The painful hammering that occurs in this poem, for example, is transfigured, emphatically reversed, and given new effect when in another poem, Cervantes opens by saying, quote, baby, you are the nail, let me be the hammer. Or alternatively, when she seductively yet comically enjoins the reader to, quote, come and nail me, kiss me, keep me on your cross. In Cervantes' book, love takes any and every form imaginable. It expresses its vast possibilities in every, in every expression of exhilaration, sorrow, levity, rage, serenity, immediacy, eroticism, absurdity, hopeless longing, hopeful energy, and every other particular that impregnates the universal category of love. But before falling in and out of love with her sonnets, we should turn, to our, atten we should turn our attention to the photograph on the book's cover, which portrays a timeless representation of love that the reader must not dismiss. The book's cover portrays an excavation near Mantua, Italy, lovers of Valdero, as they are called. Skeletons of two lovers from 4,500 BC, a young man and woman in their 20s buried in an everlasting embrace. We're taught to never judge a book by its cover, but the intensity of love that the book will unearth begins here, in the grave. A love that is now fossilized and as, much, and as such remains a spiritual constant, repressed, rep, sorry, represented through a material medium. A love that escapes human understanding and thwarts all ratiocination. A love that can be felt and expressed only through its multifarious and polyphonic possibilities.
The possibilities felt by Cervantes and expressed in her book by every poem on every page, by every word and in every line of her sonnets. On behalf of the Holloway series in poetry and the English department at the University of California, Berkeley, please join me in welcoming internationally acclaimed po poet, Lorna D. Cervantes. I was expecting a little cubby uh, deep enough. <sighs> well, as I tell my students, you're only a poet and you're only a writer when you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a lot of writing. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. I am so pleased to be here, deep inside here, and uh, I wonder if it's arrested development. There is a 14-year-old who is so jazzed to be on this campus again, this campus that gave me my education during the time of the free speech movement, this campus that gave me my education during the time of the civil rights uh, riots getting gassed outside here. This uh, uh, campus gave me my education in the Vietnam uh, uh, War moratorium where we all, the Chicanos, walked out of uh, school. I actually organized a walkout before that in May 1967. I organized a walkout in Woodrow Wilson Junior High School thanks to the educators here at UC Berkeley and thanks to those trees out there. Please save those trees and continue trying to save those trees out there. They ha all have hugs from a 14-year-old Lorna D. Cervantes. Besides memories buried here, my, the bones of my ancestors are not buried here. They're in dusty boxes in the basement of some of these buildings here. The bones of the Chumash, sacred objects, ceremonial objects of the Chumash in particular. My ancestors are here, lacking or having tags In 76, the wonderful poet Wendy Rose was a graduate student here at UC uh, Berkeley. She wanted to be in English. How many people are here from Creative Writing Program? The, the, CU, the UC Creative Writing Program, raise your hand. From the Creative Writing Program. You're a student in the Creative Writing Program. Two, three, four. Oh, well, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, the creative writing program that the Holloway series is a part of, creative writing, and so you're taking, you're majoring in creative writing. Here, are you grad students, no? Well, English with a creative writing? Yeah. I'm just wondering where the poets are in the UC, but uh, I was here for uh, uh, Ann Waldman's reading, my colleague in Boulder. Uh, uh, it was so great to see her, but uh, I was just interested. That it was wonderful to see you all, but the composition of the room was very different, and there were a lot more uh, actual poetry students from that go to the classes, poetry workshops here at UC Berkeley. Just an observation. Since the poem is for my ancestors, adobe in the walls of the Santa Barbara Mission, because also in those boxes, are uh, uh, multiple cultures of peace here on the California coast. Uh, my friend Wendy Rose, a wonderful poet, was uh, going to be a uh, grad student in the English department at UC Berkeley, but instead they channeled her into anthropology because her 
thesis was a bibliography of American Indian literature, and the response from the English department is, says, was that we can't help you, there are no American Indian writers to which to compile a bibliography. So she went to anthropology, got her degree there, did in fact uh, compile an extensive bibliography, well into 100 pages of American Indian uh, writers and American Indian literature. So as a grad student, they sent her down uh, for a dig, or w when they do digs, but in this case it was the Santa Barbara Mission. In 1976 they were uh, renovating the mission, and because it was crumbling, you know, the adobe walls, and inside of the walls, the thick walls, were the skeletons of the Chumash people. I'm Chumash. The skeletons of the Chumash were inside of the wall acting as rebar to hold up the wall, to reinforce the wall. So there wasn't anything they could do other than plaster it back up, adobe it back up. So uh, the bones, my ancestors are there, and as far as we know, this is replicated in all of the missions all up and down the coast. <clears throat> this is a Chumash rattle. When they first came here in Monterey, they were met by a procession and an elder woman holding a huge bird, it was described, a huge stuffed bird on a staff, and everyone walked behind it. I believe it was a condor. So someone uh, years ago gifted me with this Chumash rattle, and it's in the shape of a bird. I thought that was very interesting. For my ancestors, adobed in the walls of the Santa Barbara mission, after the poet Phil Goldberg, Goldvarg. The bones that hold the holy, bones grafted from baling and tar, the feathers of a sleeker bird resting in the nest, the wry sense of autumn calling like a winning smile. The rapid fire, the wind laid rest, the certainty of servitude, the last ash for the peaky. Petals of a lost desire, a woman's breast releasing a flower of milk on her dress, buckskin bark carpets the forest, manzanita swirls its own polish, her old bone gleam, her steady burn, the burl. Bones weighed in at market. The single bones, the married bones, with bands on bones, bones of a bonsai rectitude, a fortitude of factories on the horizon, bones to raise a nation, an axe, an all. Bones stripped of their acorns, bones nipped from the grave, baskets of mourning foreign to the settlers, baskets of bones with rattlers inside, baskets of bones with the teeth in hide, bounties of bones with the people inside. For every sail, there is a bone. For every bone, there is a home and a prayer calling out the human heart. Chants on a drum of human hide with a bill of sale still inside and a brand name still in tags, a, a, still in tails, a tag on the toe, a museum label, a designer death for you who were buried with the names inside.
I say this piece. Purple dove of passion for you who were robbed as bones, for you who were stripped of your meat, for you who were worked to death grinding corn at the metate you toted for their feed, the sweet smoke of age barely at your tail when they packed you up for good. Rebar for the reinforcement. O oh, savior of the mission of bones, O oh, designer death for the architect. Pope of the bones and the sainted orders, the sainted terrorists, bones that hold the holy. Amen. but I forgot. Uh. Uh, uh, I have a brand new book that's uh, just coming out. Also from Wings Press. It published that last one, uh, uh, Drive and Ciento, 100-100 uh, word love poems. I have one in the in the pike right now. Uh, oops. And I want to read a couple of poems from this new manuscript. It's called Something of the Cruelest. And it's called Something of the Cruelest because these are compiled of poems that I write every day in the month of April. How many nano pomos are there? Uh, uh, National Poetry Writing Month. Hey. Uh, uh, National Poetry Writing Month, uh, uh, where you write uh, well, it, 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 with people from all over, you write a poem a day. And so I've been doing this now for five or six years, and so uh, 30 of them, you know, in April, and so I've been selecting them for this book. Anyway, this kind of goes with that first poem. This is a poem called Burial. Under the burning stones, between the skins of mud flats and the clay tablets of a trash abandoned river, I see you, mounds of the living under the flesh of the dead, piquant wafts of your shreds, the ragged flags, a putrid longing to belong to sing once again a hallowed song of self in a place under the open freeway lanes, a voice in the rush of rush, a bare tunnel asking the question, what is buried here? Who thrusts out among the living chalk? Who answers? an unasked question. All of America is an Indian burial mound. Thank you. And Oh, that's the thing when you just get off the freeway and come to reading. <laughs> and you're on. <laughs> um, I was going to skip this because of the time, but I'll go ahead and read it. For my father. This is a poem for my father. And it's called First Thought. 
my father was a Zen Buddhist master. He was a philosopher. He's also a visual artist, Luis Cervantes. He and his wife, Susan Cervantes, started the Presida Eyes Mural Center, responsible for over 60 of the murals in the Mission District in San Francisco. He's an artist. So these two poems are for him. First thought. First thought, best thought, you had taught me. A river runs through it. The foot of the soul standing sub-stubbornly in the freeze. All the shards of ice crumpling up the banks. What survives in the ignorance. Play it away. Be ceremony. Be a lit candle to what blows you. Outside, the sun gives a favorite present. Mountain nests in ironic meadows. Otter takes off her shoes, the small hands of her feet reaching, reaching still. Far away, people are dying. Crisp one dollar bills fold another life. You taught me to care in the moment. Carve day into light or something moving in the west that doesn't destroy us. Look again in the coming summer. The cruelest month alive still eats up the hours. Regret is an uneven hand, a rough palm at the cheek, tender and calloused. I drink another glass of water, turn on the tap, for what grows, for you, for what lasts, for the last and first found thought of you. And uh, this one, coming back to the Bay Area, I just walked away from my job in Boulder and decided I want to come home, San Francisco. I left my heart here. Mm. This is the first poem I wrote, coming back. This is beat. San Francisco streets belong to me. My placenta in some fish and a fish and a bigger catch here, not sitting on the dock of the bay, this bay here, this way of loving, this grace, this freedom from the show of pain or dissatisfaction of hesitation or incongruity. Just you and me, my Cassidy, my daisy behind the inner ear. Yes, this listening, this indigenous inheritance. I buy a crystal from the corner cellar, the retired masseuse hippie we smile into another rainbow bridge. Me and Cassidy, and the open flower of a book, the open eyes of poetry, that tearing on the page. Listen, a thousand harps in the key of city lights chime on a sacred rising. Ten thousand strands of beads strung on a prayer. This hand now the casual gifting of another meal. I want this now, the one last grace, to never fall, to play this now and do it all. This is beat, the way, the way, the way. Be an artist, do it now. <laughs> And I want to read this one for um, for Cecil. Where are you? There you are, right there. <laughs> Duh. Uh, since he made a comedy like this poem, and it. Uh, Thank you. 
It goes with a poem from my first book, Emplumada, uh, still in print after all these years. Um, this is a poem called Crow. You'd think I'd know better, huh? <laughs> when all fails, revert to the table of contents. Since 30 years later, it's not in the section I thought it was. <laughs> These are companion poems, Crow. It's about a 30 year difference between them. She started and shot from the pine, then brilliantly settled in the west field and sunned herself purple. I saw myself, twig and rasp, dry and breath and ammonia smelling. Women taught me to clean and then build my own house. Before men came, they whispered, no good polished oak. Learn hammer and Phillips, learn socket and rivet. I ran over rocks and gravel they placed by hand, leaving burly arguments to fester the bedrooms with my best jeans, a 20, and a shepherd pup, I ran, flushed and shadowed by no one. Alone, I settled, stiff in mouth, with the words women gave me. And this one, sunshine knife blades. What happens after you take that hitchhike? Sunshine knife blades. Fifteen years old in five-year-old jeans, my shepherd pup, my traveling rainbow, my loyal thumb bulging with desire, my road rutted and rutting, my day ahead sorrow. My moccasined feet rolling in small kisses of bruising, a cartography of touch languishing over the tan. He put his necklace of anger safe at my throat. My ivory recorder, a still white bird in my lap, an avenue of alcoholic vapor filled the fear. In those days, our pass to pass was our smile. Innocence was a gumball treasure, and all our pockets were picked, wetted, whelped, well on our way out. We hemmed up the fortune of our flounce and folded into ourselves, jackknifed on a dare and glinting. And uh, the last poem in this manuscript in, um, this new book that's coming out next fall. Uh, although I think I want to delay it till spring. Enough of these fall, fall publications, and then you, 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 you. I think it's better to have a new book in April. No. <laughs> then when the contests come around, you know you're too late for everything, and <laughs> then you don't qualify for the next year. Anyway, uh, this is a poem called Integrity. Because love is possible, and so is integrity. 
Yours is in the integrity of flint, of steel, of iron. Yours is the integrity of birds flocking, whales in their loving pods. Yours is the integrity of sand, what moves with the will of you, all your sweet sweat, your simple construction. I love the sudden fill of you, your swell and sway. I love how you do what you say. You slay me with your truth. I love the way we fit together as if I were your seed. I love the far away look in your multicolored eyes, the land and sea of you. I love the way you look at me, that ancient shore. I love how I am more with you, your carbon, the filaments of your fine hair. I love how you hold me together, how fast and vast the ocean of this love in its gentle tide, the integrity of flesh, of salt, of we. Um, this is a new book that just came out, a Penguin Anthology of 20th Century American Poetry. Um, and I have a poem in here from my first book, Emplumada, which I wrote in my guru's class, partly wrote in my guru's uh, class, uh, my poetry guru. Never made sense to call him my teacher. It's only recently, now that I'm in my late 50s, right, that I start, okay, yeah, he is my teacher, but really he is my guru, you know, in that sense where you just sort of hang around with the guru and enlightenment sort of rubs off on you. And, and uh, of course, I'm talking about Bob Haas, Robert Haas. For five years, every Tuesday night, San Jose State, I wandered in the first day without even being enrolled, Bob being Bob. I sat in the first uh, row. He took the role, and I didn't answer in being the only Chicana, only dark person in the class, you know. He, I, I'm sure I was noticeable, and he, he kind of looked at me and then kind of shrugged like, okay, you're not, a, what's your name? And he hand wrote my name on the roll and, you know, uh, there was room, so he let me stay. And, you know, eventually I ended up actually registering for San Jose State and becoming a student uh, after every Tuesday night, seven o'clock. Bob's workshop, it was a lot like, uh, as I described it, it was a lot like uh, you walk in and he unzips his head and opens up his brain and you just sort of cock your ear and listen. And, you know, he talks about taking walks and looking at the architecture of the buildings. And there was something about the architecture and he doesn't know why it's connected to this line. Ah, oh, love, this is something, oh gosh, I wasn't planning to quote you, Bob, and now I'm freaked out. <laughs> anyway, it ended up being a poem in praise. Uh, uh, years later, all oh, love, this is something, and is it meditations on Lagunitas? Ah, this is fear and syllables. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, anyway, uh, the incredible talks, just unzipping his head and Thank you, Bob. Uh, this is a poem uh, uh, I wrote uh, after getting a manuscript of Federico Garcia Love uh, Garcia Lorca's love poems, homoerotic sonnets, sonetos uh, uh, de amor oscuro, uh, uh, that Francisco Alacón and another UC Berkeley student, Francisco Aragón, had gone to Spain and gotten this manuscript and, and uh, uh, translated it. And in the translation, something was lost. One of the poems, the line, which was the first line, love of my flesh, living death which was translated, dear heart, my, my life, 
And I'm like, no, love of my flesh, carne. Carne is not dear heart. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and for homoerotic sonnets, I mean, they assassinated Lorca as much because of his homosexuality as his politics, which I couldn't figure out from the poems anyway. You know, uh, uh, anyway, love of my flesh, living death. You know, so, so anyway, I had to, I just had to preserve that line somewhere. Uh, uh, so I wrote a poem using the line, love of my flesh, living death. And now the Poetry Foundation and others uh, 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 have this uh, um, uh, thing where, where they're, uh, they're, the, all of the high school students have a competition and they have to memorize a poem and recite it. So they're making these kids go to these, this site and choose a poem just from the list and, and recite, memorize, and then recite in public the poem, you know. And, and the, if there's four of my poems, and there are no poems I ever read out loud because some poems are meant to be, you know, processed in that neocortex and not in that, you know, inner ear going in through your ear and being processed that way, right? You know, and so uh, poor kids. So anyway, I hope this is being video. <laughs> videotaped because these kids are being videotaped and having to read it so now they can go on YouTube and see how I read the poems so they can practice. <laughs> Love of my flesh, living death. Once I wasn't always so plain. I was strewn feathers on a cross of dune, an expanse of ocean at my feet, garlands of gulls. Sirens and gulls, they couldn't tame you. You know as well as they. To be a dove is to bear the falcon at your breast, your nights, your seas. My fear is simple, heart-faced, above a flare of etchings, a lineage in letters, my sudden stare. It's you. It's you, sang the heart upon its mantle pelvis, blush of my breath, catch of my sea, beautiful bird, it's you. And, um, two great publications this last uh, season. Uh, this is a uh, Every Man's Pocketbook uh, edition of Villanelle's brand new. This is the review preview copy just out, uh, 85 Poets. Uh, all Villanelles, this is one I wrote uh, uh, to raise funds for Katrina, uh, to raise funds in particular for New Orleans, not going through Red Cross, but going through Brian Wilson, not the, which, not the ball player, but Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, was matching $100 for every $100 that you, you know, donate. Uh, uh, and so I wrote the poem, Raising Funds, Poets Raising Funds for New Orleans, and so I thought, well, I have to raise be, raise $100 because not only will he match, a, donate $100 because not only will he match $100, Brian Wilson will call me on the phone from the Beach Boys, you know, in my room, you know. <laughs> so he called me and I said, I want to write, you, I want to read you a poem I wrote for, you know, for Katrina. He says, you want to read me a poem that you wrote? I said, yes. He said, Oh, that won't be necessary. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'd really like to read you this poem. A poem you wrote? No, that won't be necessary. <laughs> After about the fourth time, finally I told him, well, it's for Clarence Gatemouth Brown, which is true. I wrote it for Clarence Gatemouth Brown, who died of a broken heart, really, after being three days in a boat uh, wandering around until he was finally found, all of his guitars, everything. Blue, wonderful blues guitarist, he died of pneumonia uh, that week. A blue wake for New Orleans, for Clarence Gatemouth Brown. There was a rhyming city on a blue bayou till a wicked wind laid waste. A nothing sound in a city soul and a nothing you can do. There was a windy will and a blue horn. You, a single name that was left in haste, 
There was a rhyming city on a blue bayou. There is a whaling city, a water high, and you left amid the residue up to your waist, a nothing sound in a city soul and a nothing you can do. There was a loving city in a blue hoodoo through a hard knock school, a river's waste. There was a rhyming city on a blue bayou, a full moon hue, a relation to do, jeweling on a spider's bed, so chaste, a nothing sound in a city's soul, and a nothing you can do. There is a silent city, a blue shirt crew. The yellow vest of savior waits. There was a rhyming city on a blue bayou, a nothing sound in a city's soul, and a nothing you can do. Okay, ciento, 100, 100 word love poems. What's your favorite number from one to 100? 79. Somebody said 70 something. 76, 76, 76. I heard that one first. 76. These are meditations. I would go to a, a word meditations on love. I would go to a site. On Thursday, get a word, and I wouldn't know what the word would be, and I had to write 100 words, so I figured it'd be a poem. I figured it'd be a love poem, and this week, the word was genius. These are a lot like tarot cards, so look out. 100 words to the genius of you. Loving you is pure genius. Smartest thing I've ever done. It's the O in my mega, the alpha to this end. It's Robert Johnson playing my heart, but lower. Loving you explains it all. My unified field, my saliva strings between the knees, my drool over you, a Jackson Pollock expression. Loving you is genius. Hans Beta refusing to make the neutron bomb. Star Wars, fake suns in some other world of us. It's the noblest prize I'll ever win. Shining as I come to know you, rust free. Loving you is quantum mechanics made simple, is charmed and quirky. You. <laughs> Another number, one to 100. Somebody said something, five? Nine? Nine? Oh. Nine? Nine and then 25, I heard. Nine, radiant. 100 words to radiant. Again, these are like tarot cards. You, in the radiant crepuscular light, your succulent heart, sex sucked lips, your twining hair, all halo and sash. You fill like the hummingbird, suckle, stay. I am radiant to imagine you, half animal, half staff of ember, your lightning rays of mirth unimaginable in the dark, in other than holding you in a spirit land, whisked away to grace my hand, the giving night, the airy dawn, the awakening from withdrawal. As the valley hunkers, mist hangs around her love. River, I flow with you, fog struck, and caught in your aperture. Your appetite for me, your blessing kiss, eyes, whimstruck, 
radiant. So 25, who, who wanted 25? Or no one wanted 25? Back there, 25? I got to see you or this Tarot thing won't work. <laughs> Oops. Uh, kaleidoscope. 100 words to the kaleidoscope of you. Baby, let me twist your tube. Let me dial you up a new dimension. Let me see you in a thousand lights. Let me eye you into infinity. Let your leg, lips and legs go akimbo. Give all your smallest bits to me. Let me gaze through you into your he art, into the many factors, into the paradise of your multiple rainbows, each color, each note in us inner song, in the inner song, each fine splice of you served up on a spinning plate. Let me handle your changes, ride past your infinite divisions. Let me turn you around, help me see through you. Another number, one to 100. Bob? 42, 42, 42, 42. Kiss. 100 words for your word, kiss. What would it take to kiss? A plane trip? A new outfit? Benign weaponry? Silken parachute? Box of coal as consolation? What will it take? to kiss that smile that breaks at your guarded silo shore. What will it take to kiss words off? Type my signature across your chest, crush in fur, bathe in life, sweat, and substance. What word will it take to silence words that duck and cover of the heart, kiss and lie in your imagined earth, kissing your matter from the maw. Let me put my lips to your fire, surround your words for the final surrender. Another number. Ocho, ocho, ocho. Yeah, that's the tactic. Let's be, let's break the law and be bilingual. <laughs> For all those people and officials and others who have, don't know their history and have never read the Treaty of Guadalupe and Hidalgo. Uh, this one is in a haiku. It's 100 words and it's nine haiku. Uh, 100 words and nine haiku into the distraction of you. Your face. Who was Ocho? Over there, oh. Your face, distraction. Distracting as a hickey, you, me, everywhere. Too darn many forms of you. Earth, air, fire, water, your enormous sea. Opening into dawn, this talking, fast walking, slow touching silence. Tree limbs branching out, each flowering memory in hummingbird's dream. This autumn burning, you distract me, your fine smoke from some ancient source. Cloud banks, frost flies, long red-faced leaves. You leave me one on some dream window. You, your long rainbow of distraction. Every hue, a new, new world too. Eucalyptus pods, serendipitously sweet, 
sensitivities. Two windows, one world, are passing through, expands us, a distraction, you. Uh, maybe one more? 69. 69. Oh, you better not say that one in English. 69. I didn't do these to the numbers. I didn't even know this was going to be a book. I didn't even write these in my, under my own name. <laughs> As you can probably tell from some of those lines. <gasps> Whoops, I didn't know anyone was going to read this, much less read it in public to a bunch of strangers. 100 words of goodbye. <laughs> uh, these are for sale. A uh, perfect Valentine's Day gift, 100 poems. There's sure to be a poem to fit every occasion. You can, you can dedicate the number of the poem to whoever the book is for. Valentine's Day is coming up. Cheap gift. 100 words of goodbye. Just 100 words of goodbye. This first day taken. This first new year. Extravagant in its pleasure of red, its greenly hills, it's winding down. It's winding down to you and past, past the warmth of your shoulder, your stroke, past the filigree of smiling eyes, your strong arm wrung. I'm writing 100 words for goodbye. I'm staying on in my future, not a perfect tense. I'm holding on to the pluperfect past of you. I'm addressing your finest nature. I'm appealing to the head of your heart. I am breaking some pact of independence, some right to bear arms. And since I got here late, any requests? Last poem? <laughs> oh, another one from there? 58, that wasn't the question, but let's see what we have here. 58, who's 58? Raise your hand so I could see you. Okay, 58. Perception, 100 words to the perception of you. I have this perception. You are who you are, been where you've been. I know. I know what anyone knows, short of nothing. I know birds return, not to me. I know what I feel, what hurts, the shape of you on top of me. Perception, like me, once extinct, now an insurrection of knowledge. Now I percolate through dreams. You dream me into cloth, into your warmth beside you. Whatever sign do I need? So plainly, snow tracks, fallen cake crumbs for you, messages that pass through mountains, pass through diamond and mist, waves of missing you, particles change. And... Do I have time for one more? Yeah, uh, I'll just read a, a few, um, I'll just read a short section, the sections from a long poem, Coffee, that's in this book that I notice you have here, Drive. There's not very many copies of this, I only have one in my possession, so uh, get them uh, if you can. Five books in one. Uh, this is a long docu-poem. Um, covers a massacre that happened in Chiapas in Mexico, among other things. Coffee, one. In Guatemala, the black buzzard has replaced the quetzal as the national bird. 
The shadow of a man glides across the countryside, over the deforested plantations. A death cross burnishes history into myth as it scours the medicinal land into coffee. Burial mounds that could be sites of unexcavated knowledge hold only blasted feathers and the molding bones of freedom. Golden epaulets glint in the fluorescent offices. Crystal skulls shine in the eyes of the man with the machete within the sight of an AK-47 under the rubble of the ruling class. A human heart beats in the palm. The tumba of ritual mercy drums in the thunderclap. A hurricane wind sounds the concha. In Quetzaltenango, foreign interests plot the futures of Mayan hands and ink and gold. While on Wall Street, the black sludge of a people trickles through the cappuccino machines like hissing snakes. Two, Aktia, December 22nd, 1997. Bloodied mud sucks the plastic sandals of a child. Vela's gutter through the saged prayers in the little church blasted through with 22 splintered holes the size of a baby's tender fist. Melon heads pop and the hacking drum of a machete counting meeting bone counts down the hours of matanza while somewhere a telephone rings off the hook. The vicar of the diocese calls in 20 minute intervals. 140 federales stand smoking in the twilight. At their feet, the trampled harvest of peasants gleams through the saturated leaves. Omero Tovia Cristiani picks up the phone. I have notified General Jorge Gamboa Solis. Everything is under control. There is no massacre in Actial. And he places the receiver again off the cradle on the well-ordered desk. Meanwhile, a young Tzotzil bloodies her knuckles, scratching the hole in the adobe wall of a cave feathered with hagwar fur, where 14 women and children wait, shivering in the dark. An infant picks up the call. The first woman in line gazes into the coke the eyes of her assassin projecting his automatic weapon into the ear of the whimpering baby at her breast. Five hundred years of history gets written in her eyes as a Sotzil mother wedges her sleeping newborn into the hole. She spits on the reddening dirt and covers her loose like a cat. Forty-five pair of shoes get lost in Aktial. Matted hair clings to the coffee plants. Another listening ear. Another red seed. Another eye dislodged from its skull. I hear nothing happened in Aktial. And if it did, no one knows who they were. The pre-press machine stands on the ridge of destiny, staring truth in the eye as men lie to the cameras, while 20 yards away, the survivors are speaking the names of the men paid $600 American, men with no families but a spoon and a copa,
Men with no names, but the trademarks emblazoned across their chests and on their running shoes. I hear 45 graves being dug today. The women form a chain of hearts. They have dried the earth, baked with their tears. Each one carries a red mud brick from the killing floor, where the people were hacked into pieces the size of a bat. Here, the bat people, Tzotziles, will build a house for their dead and pray. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.